Welcome to Introduction to Artificial Intelligence. My name is Doug Fisher. I'm the instructor for this class. Um, I first got into AI, artificial intelligence, when I was a sophomore in college. I started reading a slew of uh, uh, Isaac Asimov robot novels um, and was so taken by robotics that, uh, and the possibilities that I pushed my major from political science to computer science, mainly to study AI. I came into the field pretty naive, but uh, I can remember taking a psychology course in memory and cognition at the same time that I was taking a computer science course in uh, data structures. And I remember walking across campus one day thinking that I could model a power law of practice, which I would learned from Tara Window in my memory and cognition class, with search trees that I learned about in data structures. And it was a pretty exciting. I did a follow-up course in uh, psychology in which I, my final project was to write a computer model for uh, human concept formation. I did it in the basic programming language. That's capital B, basic. Uh, that's how old it was. I think I still have a listing that I may show you. Poole and Mackworth, and it's their book that we typically use for this class, um, ask what is artificial intelligence? And they say it's the field of computer science which is concerned with analyzing or understanding the nature of intelligence, as well as synthesizing or building systems. And the agents, as they say, uh, that we're going to be building are anything that act in the environment. And this need not be the natural environment, although it could be. It could be a built environment. It could be a high highway on which smart cars operate. Um, but it could also be simulated environments. It could be a computer operating system. It could be a computer network or a virtual world. It could even be a very restricted environment, like a computer game. They list four criteria for judging whether an agent is intelligent. And I won't argue whether they're necessary and sufficient, but these criteria of appropriateness and flexibility and learning, these are all sensible um, and understandable criteria that we might use to judge um, whether something is acting intelligently. I also have a final comment here, that AI is not concerned just with building autonomous agents, but it's concerned with building intelligent tools that can be used by humans. And when you put these intelligent tools together with humans, you get perhaps what you'd call a hybrid agent, a human plus tools. And this can be a very powerful kind of intelligence that's going to be a focus in this class. I just want to stress that the scientific goals of understanding principles of intelligence by looking at natural systems and the engineering goals of building intelligent systems, these are highly uh, interrelated and there's feedback. We understand principles, we use those principles to build tools uh, or to build AI systems and then those AI systems themselves become artifacts that we can study and experiment with. Blue and also draw an analogy between thinking machines and flying machines by which they mean that an AI, an artificial intelligence, need not operate like a natural intelligence, just as a plane need not operate like a bird. If you look at those, those circles at the bottom, um, the natural intelligences that we can actually observe, humans and other animals, or societies of humans and animals, an ant colony perhaps, um, the idea in artificial intelligence is these may be a very small part of the space of all possible intelligences and kinds of intelligences, which are represented by that other circle, uh, alien intelligences, machine intelligences, and in particular this notion of human and AI hybrid intelligences. We don't even know what those can look like, but we think that they might be quite powerful. Here's a very simple model of an agent that acts in the environment. Uh, this agent has certain abilities, thinking abilities as well as acting abilities. It has goals that it wants to accomplish. It has preferences. Um, and it has prior knowledge based on its experience, previous experience in the environment. And it takes observations from the external environment. And based on its abilities, goals, and uh, prior knowledge, it acts. Abilities, goals, prior knowledge in this diagram are shown as externalities, but clearly these are probably going to be internal to the agent. In AI, we're going to be studying how do you represent these various things, abilities, goals, prior knowledge, uh, inside the agent, and how do you represent the processes that use all this uh, information uh, to take actions appropriately. Here's an example of an agent, a robot. Um, depending on the nature of the robot, it may be a humanoid robot, and it can move, walk, uh, it can grip things. If it's a factory robot, it doesn't presumably move in the same way, but it can certainly grip uh, things coming along an assembly line. Many robots uh, speak, and uh, they can actually have facial expressions and gestures.
The observations of this robot come in different modalities depending on the robot, vision, sonar, sound. These are all very common ones. Some robots with more sophisticated software can recognize speech and gestures. Um, depending on the nature of the robot, uh, if it's a robot, its goals are to deliver food. Um, if it's a rescue robot, uh, it's to rescue people. If it's a soccer playing robot, it's to score goals. I know of no rob robots that can play human level soccer, but uh, they can play some pretty decent uh, robot soccer. This next example of an agent, a medical doctor, we typically think of as a human agent, but um, this is a good example of what a hybrid human and AI intelligence can really be and how powerful it can be. We might have a human doctor that's uh, prescribing drugs, for example, one of the abilities, and the doctor may have available an intelligent tool uh, that looks for drug interactions. And if the prescribed drug interacts in a negative way or is known to interact in a negative way with other drugs that the patient is known to be taking, the AI uh, tool can uh, raise an alarm. In this particular example, besides the uh, drug interaction tool, maybe there are other possible monitoring tools, monitoring vital signs. Perhaps you even have capabilities of an AI monitoring facial expressions of a patient to look for signs of pain. But in any case, uh, this creates a very rich possibility of humans and AIs operating together to achieve a kind of superhuman intelligence. So let's sum up. Um, AI is uh, the computational science of developing smarter artificial agents. Uh, IBM's Deep Blue is a, a good example that many of you will know. This is the first chess playing program that actually beat a human champion. And uh, it's an impressive piece of uh, software. It's something, though, that we sometimes call an idiot savant. It does one thing and one thing only very, very well, but it can't be general purpose. And from the AI as intelligent tool perspective, this is a perfectly fine thing. You have a powerful idiot savant uh, helping you, and you're a human. You achieve, you can achieve a kind of superhuman intelligence. So there's nothing wrong with this, but it's just limited. In contrast, IBM's Watson, Apple, Siri, these are question-answering programs uh, for the most part, but they're impressive, and they have a, a kind of general capability uh, you wouldn't find in, in Deep Blue. Although, again, they're limited to answering uh, uh, questions. They can't interact in the physical world. They can't play chess even, um, so they're limited in their own ways. One thing I'd like you to do is identify other examples of artificial agents that uh, act intelligently, or so you think, um, and be able to talk about them. I also want to introduce this idea of AI as the computational science of non-deterministic reasoning. For those of you who have taken formal language theory uh, and automata, you, you know about non-deterministic reasoning. AI is the science of exploring and evaluating and acting on choices. If you write a computer program, typically you're writing deterministic programs. In this state, in this machine state, you do this, and it's well prescribed. But uh, you can also write programs that explore alternatives, and that's what you're going to be doing in this class. It's going to be a very different kind of software for you. There's an interesting correspondence between AI and uh, MP, non-deterministic polynomial problems, that uh, perhaps we'll touch on later. And perhaps you'll touch on outside of your class independently. I want to end with some uh, other sources that I encourage you to look at. One is a podcast that I uh, did in 2006 on artificial intelligence and machine learning that I think is uh, interesting. Uh, another is a Radio Lab podcast, uh, Talking to Machines. Uh, and I'll from time to time point you to Radio Lab podcasts. They're, they're quite interesting. I listen to them when I run. They give me some very good ideas. And the final link here is uh, a link to a wiki book where we talk about using artificial intelligence methods to uh, work on sustainability-related problems, very much related to the uh, tool-building orientation of artificial intelligence. If you learn enough, and I'm sure you will, you can contribute to this wiki book. Apropos the wiki book discussion, I just want to point out that the role of a teacher in a class is changing radically. There are massively online courses now and other materials available that most of you probably use. I'll point out that not only can you use them, but you can contribute to them, uh, like the wiki book. But if you see niches and gaps in understanding that you think you can fill, I encourage you to do it. So, for example, do a tutorial on alpha beta search if you think that would be a, um, a good idea. You'll know what alpha beta search is later.